morning, and so I want to invite the elders up, however many are in the room. Um, this, is, this has been a little bit of a long time coming, but man, we, we couldn't be more excited. Um, we opened our fellowship is um, truly be, because of your generosity uh, financially, we are able to hire on a new staff member this year. And uh, this is a position that we haven't traditionally had in this capacity, and yet we believe it's a position that's really important for the future of this church. And so I want to bring Caleb and Jenna Smith up. Um, Caleb Smith will be coming on as our young adult pastor. Um, so he will be uh, pastoring and serving that 19 to 29 year olds. Um, so if that's you in the room, this is your new pastor. Um, and that will serve as part of his role. The uh, additional part of his role will serve in kind of traditional associate pastor type things, preaching, teaching, uh, leading worship, and some other things as well. So we are so, so excited, so blessed to have you. I, uh, first time I met Caleb, we were standing in my driveway, and uh, I asked him, I said, so what, like, what's your deal? What do you want to do with your life? And he said, I want to serve the Lord. And I said, no, 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 like, for real, like, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> and he said, I want to serve the Lord. And uh, immediately my heart was knit to him. And then uh, a few months later, we were spending some time, and he was, he was walking me through some of the things he believed about Scripture and about God. And uh, some of the theology that he understood. And I said, Caleb, where did you learn that? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, like, where did you learn that? And he goes, like, the Bible? <laughs> I said, yeah, that, that place. So uh, this is a man who the hand of God is on him, and we are delighted to have him. And I know a couple of the elders wanted to share I wrote it down because it's that important. All right. So uh, we all know it's a sacrificial and honorable thing to choose as a vocation uh, the service of God's people. Um, God has called you and you both have said yes. Caleb and Jenna, God smiles on your desire to meet the needs of his people. Satan hates it. We do and will pray for your marriage and all the ways the evil one attempts to break you. That we put those things before the Father who holds your marriage in his hands. And so, Caleb, we affirm and trust your reliance on God for all things. Your view of the supremacy of his word, of your faith in Jesus as your only hope. As you lead your family well, open your home to others, disciple, teach, build relationships, the kingdom of God is strengthened and grows because of your faithfulness and obedience. Jesus, these elders, and this body will be with you and lift you up in dark valleys and in the green pastures. Jesus has great things ahead for you. Caleb, uh, I, I really wanted the body to hear because what you know, it's clear to anybody who's been around you and sees you lead worship and when you preach that you have the gifts that God has bestowed on you. But uh, I think what we heard and what I heard that just knitted my heart so close to yours is the amazing um, humility that, that you have and, and that you want uh, nothing more to serve God, but, but you understand uh, that you are a man inside a fleshly body and you are dependent on him and that's your humility uh, and I just as I was asking God this morning of what to say he brought this passage to mind in 2nd Corinthians oh, I missed my glasses. Uh, <laughs> su such confidence we have through Christ toward God not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves but our adequacy is from God who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Hey, look at this cute couple. <laughs> we 
if you guys would stand, and uh, I'm going to close us with some prayer. Um, I'd love you to just raise your hand forward toward um, Jenna and Caleb. Father, um, we take this very serious. And uh, Lord, we now are giving you Caleb, Jenna, and Lacey. Lord, we ask you to protect them, guide them, give them wisdom, allow them to teach, allow them to lead us. Lord, we ask you to do these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, we, uh, we also get the privilege of hearing from Caleb today as he preaches. So if he doesn't do great, if he doesn't do great, we still have time to neg negotiate some things. Um, love you, brother. Love you. Hey, look at this, too. The matching. The matching outfits. Come on. All right. Knock it out. Oh. Man. Uh, I'm speechless. Mm. And I'm hot. <laughs> but seriously, I'm, I'm truly, truly blown away, you guys. Um, as you can tell, I'm not from around these parts. <laughs> and just coming up on three years, living here in the desert. And, um, and it didn't take me long to feel at home and and it wasn't the palm trees or the mountains or the lack of anything other than brown in the <laughs> color palette that made me feel at home it was you and uh, had the privilege just the other night of um, hanging out with the staff and the elders and and I got to share a little bit about part of what made me feel at home when we were coming home back here from the last time we visited Australia um, I had this sense coming back to America, I'm going home. I'm going home. And um, one of the first faces that flashed past my, my, my mind was Mike Quinn. And um, it, <laughs> it's truly people that um, make you feel at home. And many, many of you have, have, have done that for me. Um, and so I thank you and I thank you for trusting me. <laughs> I'm just a, just a small town boy. And um, I feel really, really honored and blessed to get to stand here and get to love you guys. So thank you. I love you, Caleb. Yeah. I love you, Caleb. Well, you've had little glimpses of my life, um, but I thought it'd be a good place to start. Just share a, a few more little um, snapshots from from the Aussie kid. And uh, so I grew up in Tasmania, the island under the island. Um, it's kind of the butt of Australia. <laughs> but actually, even though it gets the butt of the jokes, um, one of the jokes is that everyone down there has two heads because there's not many people live there, so they, they think we're all inbred, but <laughs> don't believe them. It's not true. And, um, but it's actually the most beautiful place in all of Australia, and, and I'm not saying that just because I'm from there. But I grew up on a dairy farm, multiple dairy farms, milking cows, and you don't do it by hand anymore. People still think that, but <laughs> big machines. And so I grew up doing that. And the town that was near us only had one set of traffic lights. And there was about 4,000 people there. And the school I went to went from kindergarten to grade 12. And it only had about 400 people. And, and so it's a lot different uh, living over here. Not just the fact that we're a long way from the beach. And um, there aren't green rolling hills. But... Um, it's a big city, um, and so that it's, uh, it's a lot different to where I grew up. But uh, I think what I really wanted to, to touch on in my story to start with was uh, I, just, I just, as I look back over my life, I see this question that the Lord has asked me, whether I knew it at the time or not, was, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And as I look back over every instance of my life, there were times that I heard him asking me that, and there were times that I didn't. But, but I, as I look back, I see that he was, he was wooing me to himself from the moment I was born, 
and he was asking me, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And um, at six years old, I remember asking Jesus to come into my heart and, and trusting in him. But it wasn't until I was about 17 that my life really, really became sold out for the Lord. And uh, my parents had divorced around that time and I was in a job that I really didn't want to be in. And, and, you know, it was just one of those times in the formative years of your life where it just feels hard, you know. And, um, and I, I began to hear that, that question, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And um, I remember in one of the, the darker times of that, of that season, the Lord putting a picture in my mind of a road that went um, in two different directions. It was like a fork in the road. And, and as I saw this picture, I knew that, that one, one road, if I traveled down it, was, was basically to shake my fist at God and say, you said you were good. You said you would be with me. And right now, I feel far from you and it doesn't feel good. The circumstances don't feel good. And, and to go down that road would be to shake my fist and say those things to God. But to go down the other road would be to answer the question that he was asking me, do you trust me? It was to answer that with a yes to go down that road. And, and it did not mean that I would understand. It didn't mean that I would know why the circumstances were the way they were. It didn't mean that they would change even. But I knew that to go that way would be to say, yes, Lord, I trust you anyway. And I remember I prayed those words out loud. No one was listening but God. And I said, God, I trust you anyway. And I tell you, that was the most pivotal moment in my, my walk with the Lord in my whole life. When I said, Lord, I trust you anyway. It was as though for the first time in a way I'd never experienced it before, my faith became my faith. And I had this sense that even if everyone around me, my parents, my grandparents, my church, if, even if all of them had come up to me in that moment and said, we don't believe in this anymore, I knew I, I would. I knew, I knew that I would. And it, it changed everything. And it was though everything I'd heard growing up in church, um, the people that I'd trusted, the things that they'd taught me and showed me in the Lord, in the Word, it was as though that they began to make sense. And it was though it was like one of those connect the dots things and the dots were starting to connect and I saw Jesus. They came together to paint Jesus. And uh, I had this sense of the good news, the gospel. Um, all of a sudden, I had never had an urgency that it, it had to be told to other people. And, and in that moment, I had that urgency welling up in me. And I remember I was involved in our youth group. And I, and I, I came to our youth leaders and I said, can I share the gospel? I, they, these, guys, these kids, they grew up in church, but I, I just... I just feel like I have to share it. And I remember I would, I, would, I would give some form of gospel message every Friday, every other Friday, and I, I was very zealous, and, and, I, and I would do the altar call, and no one would ever come. <laughs> maybe they already knew it, maybe they already believed, and maybe I was just an excited, passionate young kid. But I, I kept... I kept doing it and I haven't looked back and I've always been excited about the gospel ever since. And uh, Some of you know I was doing a plumbing apprenticeship of all things at the time. It was crap. <laughs> I'm a dad now so I'm allowed to say that. Um, but I really wasn't enjoying it. I don't know why I did that but I did. And I finished that and I, and I, I, I was just being transformed by the Lord throughout this period and having this sense of like, I've got to understand the word. I was getting excited and I knew once I finish this thing, um, I, want to, I want to do something where I can study the word. And You know, at that point in my life, I, I had this understanding of God's will that I believed that there was this very specific thing that I had to do. And uh, if I wasn't doing it, then, then, I would, then I'd ruined everything and I, I wasn't in the will of God. And I think I've learned... It's a little bit more to it than that. But at the time, that's what I believed. And I'm like, well, God, there must be a Bible school that you have for me to go to. And so I, I began to do some research and had a sense to write this one down and this one down. And my grandfather, he told me about a, a, a guy named Major Ian Thomas 
who started torchbearers. It started in England in a castle called Cape and Ray Hall. And my grandfather said, hey, when I, when I was just growing in my faith as a young Christian, I used to listen to cassette tapes of a guy named Madrian Thomas in the tractor while I was doing farm work. And I said, I think he started a Bible school. And so I was like, oh, okay. I wrote that down. So I had this list. of. Anyway, when I looked it up, the first thing that came up was that there was one in Australia. I didn't know there was ones all over the place. And, um, and so I wrote that down. And I had five of them on my list. And, and I just believed that one of them was the will of God. And I said, Lord, make a way. Show me which one you want me to go to. Illuminate it up off the page. Um, maybe I need to, and so maybe I need to go out into a field and maybe you would just split the clouds and speak it to me. And, and I wrestled with God and, and, and I couldn't see how he could lead me any other way. And months went by and I, and I, and I got frustrated and, and, and didn't feel that I was being led. And uh, I remember in my frustration, he, he still used my frustration, I ended up saying, Lord, I believe that you're just going to show me when you're ready. And I, that, that's, I think that's what he wanted to teach me, but I kind of did it in frustration. <laughs> you'll, I believe you'll show me when you're ready. And um, anyway, some friends and I had planned on uh, doing a bit of a trip to a couple of different countries. In, we went to uh, Thailand and China and Japan in this four-week extravaganza. It was incredible. And um, so me and these two friends, and so the first place we went to was Thailand, and we, we were just having fun, checking out the sites, and we had known that there was a missionary um, from Australia who had come to our church once who was working at an orphanage in uh, a place called uh, Chiang Mai that was just about an hour flight from where we were in Phuket. And so we were like, let's go and check this place out and visit this lady, and that sounds fun. And so we, we jumped on a flight and we went and saw this orphanage, and she's giving us a tour of the place, and I hear these other Australian accents. And, um, and so I went over and I introduced myself to the group, and there's um, the lady that's running this group that's also kind of visiting this orphanage. I, she starts asking me questions, you know, like, what do you want to do with yourself? What do you want to do next year with your life? And I said, I just, I was in the last year of my plumbing apprenticeship, and I said, I just, next year I just, I want to go to a Bible school, but I just don't know where to go. And um, she said, well, I live just down the road from this place called Cape and Ray, Australia. And um, that was one of the ones on the, le- the list of five. And, you know, it was a- as though the list came into my mind and those words began to glow. <laughs> And, um, but it was incredible that I just knew without a shadow of a doubt that in the moment that she said those words, that that was the Lord saying that that's where I want you to go. And, you know, God did the crazy thing. He, he, did, he did it even if it was in my mind. And, um, you know, sometimes I think we, we can have a misguided or misunderstood um, understanding of, a, of, a tr- of Scripture of a scriptural truth. So for me, I think it was the will of God. I didn't fully understand it at that moment. I still don't. Um, But I think God still uses it. I I think God still leads us even when we don't fully understand it. And I think that was an example of that. And that led me to Cape and Ray, Australia. I went there and it was an incredible time. And uh, eventually they offered me a job to work there and uh, for about a year. And uh, in, in amongst all that time, I, I got to go over and spend a couple of months studying at the centre in England, where it all began. And, um, and it's where I met my amazing wife, Jenna. And uh, it, what, what, a, what a gift that was, if, if I didn't remember or learn anything else. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was an incredible time. And... Uh, You know, we decided we were going to get married. I'm having to condense a lot here. And what a, what a long, drawn-out process it was to get here, the, pro, the visa process. And, and again, what God began to say over me and over me and over me as, it, as we cancelled our wedding because you know, all the, the paperwork wasn't coming through was, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And you know, there's many, many times in our life that feel 
very difficult to trust the Lord. And there's many times that it seems like it makes so much sense that we don't even think about trusting him. And it's this seemingly roller coaster sometimes. But, but, but God says in Proverbs, he says, trust, he says, trust in me with all of your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge me in everything you do and I will I'll lead you. And uh, he's been so faithful. I remember it being so difficult. The first little while being here in America, just going from being in this ministry position in Cape and around, feeling like, yes, this is what I'm made for. This resonates with everything that I felt you've made me for. And then I, I come here and I'm not allowed to work and the visa process is still going. And I, I remember I get this little landscaping job and in the middle of the summer and I've never sweat so much in my life. It was like, it was like my head was a shower head and like my eyes were stinging. And, and, and a month into marriage, Jenna's mum passed away and I didn't know what to do. Jenna was broken and I'm mowing lawns in stupid heat and I was homesick and uh, I ended up getting this job that I had for the last two and a half years, sanding and painting furniture. And the amount of times I broke down and cried and said, I, I thought I was made for something else, God. This doesn't feel like what you made me for. This doesn't feel like your plan. This doesn't feel like where I thought I would be or should be. And he, he began to say that it's not about where you are. It's not about what you're doing. But it's me, it's me, it's me, it's me. And I'm with you. And I've never left you. Do you believe that I'm faithful? Do you believe that nothing can separate me from you? Do you believe your worth is the same whether you have some sandpaper in your hand or whether you do what you believe you were made to do? Do you believe that your worth is found in me? I believe it, Lord. I believe that you're faithful. You always have been and you always will, even when it doesn't feel like it. Should we preach? Should we preach now? <laughs> I want to talk about this reality that I'm pretty confident in, that life starts now. And I think that that tail end of my story just then is going to be a good segue for that. How many know what it's like to want something that you don't have? <laughs> maybe it's not something, but maybe it's somewhere. Like, how many of you are thinking about what's for lunch? Or how, <laughs> how many are thinking, like, what sport game is on? Is it March Madness or something right now? Because it's this reality in, in this world that we live in. Either I'm thinking about what I want that I don't have, or I'm thinking about where I want to be, where I'm not. <laughs> and I just feel like in, in this social media world, it's like there's more and more content, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram. The content just keeps coming, but we're more and more discontent. We're less happy, less satisfied. And it's like I'm scrolling, wanting something that's not in front of me. But the moment that the next thing that wasn't there before comes, I just do it again. Or, or, or it's, I'm three and a half hours deep into some Netflix binge. <laughs> wanting to be somewhere that I'm not. Wanting to escape. And we say stuff like this all the time. I want a different president. I want a different job. I just want to be on vacation. I just want this newborn crying phase to be over. <laughs> I 
preach. I just want a different co-worker. I just want my kids to listen. I just want to be married. But here, get this one. In the pursuit of healthy longing for good things, our desire for what has not yet come quickly breeds dissatisfaction in our heart and the inability to truly live in the present. I'm going to read that again. In the pursuit of healthy longing for good things, our desire for what has not yet come quickly breeds dissatisfaction in our heart and the inability to truly live in the present. And especially in times like this, COVID, we get so bogged down by the realities of life. You name it, our lives have been flipped upside down, whether it's working from home, whether it's kids at home all the time, whether it's lost my job, whether it's can't pay my bills. And, and I've heard... A lot of people say, I just want to be with the Lord. I just want to be in glory. I just want to be with Jesus. And part of this longing is good and right. We should desire that. We should long to be with him. We, 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 should, we should be expecting his return. But I think it can, we can quickly lose sight of all that Jesus has done for us now. And we can find ourselves living as though the finished work of Christ isn't anything more than a golden ticket to heaven. And I know that sounds harsh, but I do it. Living as though life starts then rather than now. It, it, and it's actually missing the fullness of the gospel. There's this example um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it's almost like an inverted example um, of what we're talking about here. But, but the heart of it is this, that they too were missing the fullness of the gospel. And so there's this story in 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul, he's addressing this, this reality that had happened in this church where they had actually begun to believe that there wasn't a resurrection. And um, there's this verse, verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? So he's basically saying to him, look, there's no point going around preaching this gospel that Jesus was raised if you don't believe that you're going to be raised. He said it doesn't make sense. Either he was raised and so will you, or he wasn't and you're still dead in your sins. Because the, 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 the proof of, of, of the resurrection is life. Then and, and, and now. And the Corinthians, they were missing the reality of the resurrection in the life that came after they died. But I wonder, when we get so bogged down and, and upset and wanting to, wanting to escape and, and, and wanting to be somewhere we're not, I wonder if we can miss the reality of the resurrection in the life we have now. And it's true, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, but he's not just waiting for you to die so you can be with him. He didn't wash you clean just to leave you in the mess. He came that you would have life. Not just for the hereafter, but for the here and now. But what does it mean that eternal life starts now? What does that actually mean? If it's true that it isn't just this thing after we die, if it's not a place it's a, or a length of time, then, then what is it? There's this beautiful quote by Peter Reed. He's, a, he's the director at the Capenray Torchbearer Centre in Germany. He was sharing his testimony and he had this, this same realisation. He said this, Somehow I had relegated Jesus to heaven instead of enjoying him on earth. Somehow I didn't understand that eternal life doesn't speak of heaven, it speaks of Jesus, and that God did not leave me alone on earth to watch me struggle to try and make it into heaven. Isn't that good? I needed to hear that. Jesus gives us a pretty good definition of eternal life. He says this in John 17, 1-3. He's praying um, right before 
his betrayal and crucifixion, he prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. He says this, this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So this is eternal life, that we know God and Jesus Christ, whom he sent. That it isn't a place, it's not a length of time. And I don't just have to wait till I've died to enter into it. He's the way, he's the truth, he is the life. He, he is the life. So the means of receiving this life, which is eternal life, which is Jesus himself, is through knowing him. It was never about a place. It was always about a person. And and the ability to know him is not about your determination. It's not about your striving or your strength. And he so knew that our sin and brokenness and hardness of heart meant that we couldn't know him. That it actually separated us from him. That he became sin. He actually became our sin. He took it upon himself. He endured the cross and his precious, perfect blood has washed you as white as snow. And he doesn't need to be crucified again. Because it it worked. It's done. It's finished. And the only thing to do is respond to what is done. In Colossians 1.16, Paul says, For by him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Get this. All things, that means you too, were created through him, as the source and for him. <laughs> you were actually made for him. It's not just like you could choose Jesus if you feel like it sounds good and you want that. But you were actually made for him. Like, not only is he the source of life, not only did he make a way for it to be even possible to know him, but you were actually made for him, like designed for him. Like you're incomplete aside from him. Unless he be in you, unified with you, that you will never be and cannot ever be all that you were made to be. That scripture says that you're actually spiritually dead. And that that separates you from wholeness. For he makes you whole by filling the hole in you. You know, it's like a guitar is made for music, right? But it's like if we don't have the spirit of the living God, we cannot play that music that we were made for. And without that, and if we lose sight of that truth, We just end up trying to do what we think we're supposed to do. And I often say it's kind of like getting a guitar and using it as a cricket bat. (laughs) It sounds like, I mean, it'll hit the ball, won't it? Or a baseball bat. (laughs) You know, it'll, I mean, it looks like, you know, it's got kind of like a thing you can hold and it's got like a flat spot on it. And that that could be what it's for, couldn't it? But it's not. (laughs) And we do that with our own life. It'll work. I can make it work. I could do this thing. Kind of looks like it fits. But you were made to be filled by the Spirit of the living God. And and, and any attempt to be and live outside of that, both falls short of the life that you were made to experience and the blessing that others around you were made to experience. Because it's not just about you. What? The resurrection means that Jesus succeeded in what was necessary for him to reconcile you back to him. For now. For life. Now. Now. His blood washed you clean, but his life makes you 
alive now. That, that actually means something. More than just the warm, warm and fuzzies and the ooey gooeys. It changes everything. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, you were sealed and filled with the promised Holy Spirit in that moment. In that moment. The fullness of deity. The divine nature. Jesus Christ himself, all of him, in all of you, in that moment. And so, if you've lived as though that reality doesn't mean that there's life for now, then that's what I'm here to remind you of. Because Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Is that hard for us to hear today? Do we hear that and think, well, I don't want to be less me. I don't want to die. Well, what if we just needed to be reminded that you cannot truly be you unless Christ be in you? What, what, if, what if when, uh, was it John who said, there needs to be less of me and more of him, what if he realised that truth? That the less there is of that you, pre-him, the more you, you truly become. So, so read that through that lens. You're not becoming less of yourself, you're becoming more of yourself. Because Christ lives in you. And it's because that mystery that had been hidden for ages has now been revealed, which is Christ in you, your only hope of glory. <coughs> Through faith, your old self, all that separated you from knowing Jesus, it's crucified with him. Dead, done. He did it. He dealt with it. He paid for it. And he remembers it no more. He doesn't hold it against you. You know, many of us, myself included, we forget that life starts now. And I love the image that Caleb gave to us in one of his messages when we were going to start through Psalm 23, of the shepherd and the sheep. And many of us, we do this to ourselves. We believe that if we have forgotten a, a scriptural truth, if we've began to wander, if we've began to not walk in step with the Spirit and we've kind of just gotten off in the weeds and we've forgotten that life is actually for now, we, we kind of tell ourselves that the shepherd kept on going and now I've realized that I, I, I need to be walking in step with the shepherd and I've got a little bit of work to do now. I've got some catching up to do now. Oh, he's off there with the rest of the sheep. And uh, what, a, oh my goodness, I, it's, been, it's been five Sundays now since I've been to church. And uh, where, where was I up to in my reading plan? And, 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 and we realize in reality, we lift our eyes and he's never left. We lift our eyes and the shepherd is actually right there. And somehow he's still with the other sheep. Don't make yourself think that if you've been wandering off in the weeds for three months, that you've got three months' work to catch back up. Because he, he said, when he said it's done, it's done. When he said you've been sealed and filled, it was true. And he's doing work in you. He's making you more like him. And he's gracious when you get off in the weeds. But let me tell you, just realize it now and keep going. Just realize it now. And keep going. Because he's not casting shame over you. He's not saying, you silly sheep. <laughs> he's looking at you with the most earnest, loving eyes. And he's saying, I'm so, so glad that you're here. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right? Let's believe that together. And Jesus said, John 10.10, 10, he said, that I came that they would have life abundantly. I wonder if we've become discouraged because sometimes we create our own definitions of scriptural truth. Like, I wonder if we actually make our own definition of what abundant life is. I bet we all have. Because we listen to the world sometimes. And the world tells you that living abundantly is all about you. And living abundantly is feeling good. 
Living abundantly is having lots of things. Living abundantly is going on lots of vacations and uh, just doing whatever you want to do. That's the abundant life, the world says. But what if we just discovered or be reminded of that the life is? Jesus is the life. He is the life. So, in other words, he's saying, I came that you would have me abundantly. Oh, that makes more sense. I came that you would have me abundantly. The abundance of Jesus, the fullness of God himself, the embodiment of love changes everything. It has to. It has to. Right now. Like you're different right now. Like in who you talk to, in where you go. That his life exudes from you, longs to be making you you, speaking through you, helping you to see. And what if rather than us getting so caught up on on how to, to, with clauses and sub-clauses, define every little issue that the world brings out of, what if we just fell in love with him? What if we just walked with him? What if we just so knew he was our life, that that would penetrate the world around us, that that would change the world around us? Not by knowing how to enter this club and this social issue, but what if Jesus just changed lives like he's changed yours? He wants to do it through you. He's our hope. He's our source of joy. He makes you whole. He goes with you. He'll never leave you. When the world wrongs you, when they hurt you, he says, remember that they hurt me too. But I took all that hurt upon myself. I took it all upon myself. I took it to the cross And I paid for it. I even paid for how you hurt me. And I won. Love won. I did it. That reality has to change the next time you get hurt. It doesn't mean that it didn't hurt. It doesn't mean that it doesn't take time. It doesn't mean that it's not hard. But the fact that we know that he took all that pain and brokenness upon himself and dealt with it, and now you have his new uh, victorious life in you, that has to change the way we respond in, in light of being hurt. Because we now see them through the love of Jesus. Let me be me in you. That you could truly experience the life you were made to experience, which is me. Let me be me in you, that my life would invade the darkness of this world around you, through you, like I actually want to use you. Would we see what Jesus has done and believe it for now? Could we say, like Paul, even as he wondered if he was going to be put to death, he said, For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Like that would be amazing if I could be with the Lord in glory for all eternity. But to live now is Christ. And in that passage, he's saying the reason that that I want to live now and I understand that my life now is Christ is for the blessing of those around me who the Lord's given me. Who has God given you? That you would be Christ to them. Could we see and believe that Christ is actually more than enough? Like if you never had what you thought you needed. Like if life never had those mountaintop moments, which it will. But if it didn't, would Christ be enough? Would he be sufficient? Can we say like Paul said in Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. For I've learned in whatever situation I'm to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learnt the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Not what, not whatever I want. I can't just go and do whatever I want. Because remember, I was crucified with Christ. And now 
the made whole version of me lives and I want to do what he wants to do. And I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I want to leave us with these words from Paul in Colossians 2, 6 to 10. Therefore, as you received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. These truths, this, this reality that life is for now because the life of Christ is in you, we celebrate that and remember that because of the finished work of the cross. And so now we, we go to the table and we take this juice and, and this cracker as, as, as remembrance, as a symbol that points us to what Jesus accomplished. And, and, and I, I, I ask that as you take this this morning, that you would be, just be so overwhelmed and thankful to the Lord for what this means for now. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for what you have done. Thank you that you sent your Son, that you so longed for relationship with us, that you so longed that we would be your hands and feet in this world, that you sent your Son as a perfect sacrifice. We pray um, that we would remember this, Father, and we thank you um, that it worked, that you rose again. In Jesus' name, amen.